All right, thanks, Ted. Uh, I do want to take a moment to recognize two Council Member Lopez in the audience. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. I am Nate Myers from the Chandler Museum. I'm going to take this uh, moment uh, before we get started to uh, uh, market a couple of the upcoming museum events as well uh, as this one. Uh, Ted mentioned the Our Stories program coming up. Uh, the museum has also partnered with Elmo Draft House to do a film series of uh, Western films. Uh, the next one is, what is this, Cindy? The 19th. The 19th, and which movie is that? Silverado. Silverado. Um, so you can go online to Elmo Draft House's website and uh, reserve your tickets for that today. The proceeds from that benefit the Chandler Museum's Chandler Chuck Wagon Cook-Off. Uh, after that one, I think on the 26th, is Maverick, um, so please uh, please come out to those movies. And then on October 17th, we have Trivia Night with Marshall Shore over at uh, Elmo Draft House as well. That's a lot of fun, good time, so come on out and see if you can beat uh, Vice Mayor Hartke or Council Member Lopez, because they, uh, they're good. <laughs> and then uh, finally on November 10th and 11th, out at Tumbleweed Ranch, we have the Chandler Chuck Wagon Cook-Off coming up, which is a good time. If you haven't been out to it or heard of the event, uh, there are uh, 10 wagon teams from across the West who have authentic 1880s truck wagons, and they come out and compete in a, a Food Network-style judged competition in, uh, in five-course meals, uh, prepared with only things that would have been available uh, on the cattle drive trail. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, that's a free event to attend. Uh, the meals themselves are $15 each, but it's free just to attend. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the star of today's show, uh, my grandfather, uh, Robert F. Bender. Um, thank you so much for stepping in and, and filling in here. I'm excited about this opportunity to, to talk with you and, and uh, share some of the stories that I've heard, uh, but these people haven't heard. They're they're funny. They're uh, they're kind of scary sometimes. They're heroic. So it, they run the gamut. So I'm going to turn it over to you if you just want to do a quick introduction and jump right in and talk about basic. Well, first I'd like all the World War II veterans to please stand. Are you going to stand? <laughs> uh, <coughs> I guess I'm the only one here. I'm, I'm 95, so. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is the first group I've ever talked to about my experiences because I didn't think they were interesting. As a matter of fact, I didn't even write about them to my, what finally became my wife because I didn't think they were interesting. And I don't think the letters I wrote to her were very interesting because I signed them at the end, sincerely yours. <laughs> but it's dark. <laughs> but anyway, um, you can judge for yourself how interesting they are after, as I go through this. But I thought I would start with uh, um, boot camp. Sure. And, and go through the war and then that'll be it. Yeah, we'll just have a conversation. Well, uh, boot camp uh, started for me in uh, somewhere around 42 or 3, I guess. I don't know the exact dates. I'm not going to try to give you exact dates. And uh, it started by my father taking me to a railroad station in Syracuse, New York, and putting me on, on a train that bound for Atlantic City. I didn't know it was going to Atlantic City. Matter of fact, we got on that train and they pulled all the shade because they didn't want light going out. The enemy might shoot us, you know. And that was the thought. But anyway. We were on our way to Atlantic City. It was January, somewhere around the, the early, early part of January. It was cold at that time. And just before we got to Atlantic City, they stopped the train and told us all to get out and line up along the track. And then they said, OK, everybody drop their pants. I'm like, gosh, I'm embarrassed. I, 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 don't, I don't even do that in my house. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the purpose of it was, and, and in the distance you could see the buildings of Atlantic City. Can you everybody hear me? Yes. I don't know what you want. 
But anyway, we could see the buildings of Atlantic City in the distance, and it was cold. We dropped the pants, so I was in Rome do what the Romans do, so I dropped my pants. And uh, it was a, the purpose of it was uh, check for venereal disease. So we got back on the on the train and went into Atlantic City, got our uniforms, and incidentally, we lived in the some of the hotels that Atlantic City uh, had at that time. They must have kicked everybody out for us. And uh, of course, we had to take a famous boardwalk uh, to enjoy. But anyway, I got in one of the motels, from hotels, and stayed there for a month. And if you can live through basic training, you can live through anything. Because they'd get you up at 4.30 in the morning, and I don't know why they got us up that early, but you're supposed to clean them. <coughs> and then uh, take us off for breakfast about 6. Hurry up, get in line, go to breakfast. But then uh, after breakfast, and incidentally, you had to eat everything on the plate. They had somebody there to watch you as you go out and make sure you clean the plate. We'd, uh, and as we were standing ready to eat, we had a man on each side of us giving us shots. Not every day, but that's what happened. And I'm not very good with needles, but I, I never fainted, but some did. And uh, the, the one thing I remember about basic training is only a month long. Two things. One was the pay. We got $21 a month. We were buck privates, although I wanted to fly an airplane. And uh, we got $21, but of that 21 they took six out of French yards. So we didn't get very much money in those days. But people say, yeah, but those were $21 is a lot of money in those days. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the one thing I remember about Atlantic City is that after marching in the sand all day and uh, having gotten up at 4.30, at the end of the day they said, you're on KP. That's kitchen duty for the night. And I said, but I got a cold. Doesn't matter. And I'd like to go on sick leave. Well, no, you can't go on sick leave. I think I got a flight fever. Well, we'll check it. And it was about, a, it was under, somewhere around 100. He said, it has to be 101 to get on sick leave. Go on and do your cake. So I had a drippy nose. And the first thing they gave me was to wash chicken in a big barrel. And my nose was dripping in that time. <laughs> and then at 3 o'clock, they say, okay, now make the toast. Well, I was sick. I was, I was sick. At 3 o'clock, I wasn't feeling very good. I didn't care where I dripped. And you know where it went, right on the toast. <laughs> at 5 o'clock, they said, okay, uh, uh, you're through with the toast. Go on home. And I said, well, do I have to get up? And march with all these other guys. No, you can sleep until 10. So I had to get up at 10. Anyway, that, that whole thing lasted a month, and we got out of there, and I was ready to leave the place. And from there, we went to Syracuse University. The important thing uh, in this, and I think it's a really cool twist in your training story, is to note that you grew up on a farm in Fayetteville, New York, uh, for those of you who are familiar with upstate New York, that's one of the suburbs of Syracuse. So you leave Syracuse uh, for Atlantic City, and then you get on a train not knowing where you're going, and where do you get off? <laughs> we did, had no idea. And when we got back on the train after that month's training, we didn't know where we were going to go either. But I was sent right back to Syracuse <laughs> because we went to Syracuse University, and they trained us in meteorology. And, uh, by professors to meteorology and whatever, whatever we needed, that what they what they thought we needed to fly that. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, did you ever uh, get to see your parents while you were in uh, Syracuse? They came to see me. I uh, a bunch of fellows. Oh, incidentally, when I joined up, just before I joined up, enlisted. Uh, you had to have two years of college, so they said, be at least 21 years of age. And um, let's see, what was the other thing, requirement? 21, college, single. Well, in 42, they wanted a 
going to turn out 100,000 pilots a year. And that pool wasn't big enough, so they had to make the requirements a little, a little uh, more lenient. So they cut out the two years of college, said you can pass this test. They let the 18-year-olds get in, and if you were married, you could get in. So I, 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 I enlisted in the Air Corps because I didn't want to walk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. And then they took you after three semesters of college, right? Because they dropped the two years? I, uh, I got through the first year of college, and I was in the second year, and I, I knew pretty sure they were going to, they, they said you could graduate, but I, I knew that was not going to happen. I was called up before the end of this uh, first semester in the second year. So, yeah. um, then, when you're at Syracuse, uh, doing your training, uh, you got sick again, right? Oh gosh, yes, I was smoking cigars. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of the married people, had, their wives had kids, and uh, they were anxious to get out cigars. And I never smoked before. I started inhaling, and uh, I got awful sick. <laughs> so not much so, they put me in the hospital what they called a hospital, and uh, probably had spinal meningitis. And because uh, some one of the guys did have it, so they said, We're going to tap their spine, is that okay? I know. <laughs> so I said, Go ahead. And said, no anesthetic or anything. They just told me to hang on to this nurse's hand. And boy, I didn't hang on. <laughs> and they tapped the spine and found that I just had a cold. But I stayed there for 10 days, and that was the time I was supposed to have one. Yeah, that was during your furlough, right? That was my furlough. So you didn't get to go home? And that's when my dad and mother came to see me, but that was the only time I saw them. Yeah. We get to go home. Yeah. I spent two months there, and then went on to Nashville to decide whether you're going to be a pilot, navigator, or bombardier. And you had to take various tests. And uh, I, I made it. I wanted to be a pilot. Everybody did. And I made that at Nashville and was sent to Maxwell for some more training. And more training that just before I was going to Camden to fly that thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, that thing? Yeah. The, uh, you the steer man? From that. <laughs> yeah, you want to you jump in on the steer man? And well, where you started with? Yeah, that the, the, almost, I would say all pilots of World War II had to fly that plus two others and they will come up in a minute. But uh, that was a tough old airplane. And it's a good thing because a lot of people, after their solo, tried to land it at 15 feet on the ground. And of course, it, it was a circus to watch them. <laughs> and then if you didn't keep the airplane going straight, but once you land it, you ground loop it. You know what a ground loop is? Well, you gotta keep it going straight. If it turns a little bit, one of the wings will hit the ground, and then the, turn, the airplane spins around that, that uh, point, and probably you wash out. <laughs> that, was a, that was a concern. And when you say wash out, that means you're, you're done, you're, right? you're, You go to the end of the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want that. No, we don't want that. Well, the interesting thing about that is the way you start it. You uh, get out on the wing, and you crank it, and you get a great big flywheel going. Then you quickly get in the airplane, store the crank, and uh, pull a little toggle switch or hit it. And that spinning wheel is supposed to start the engine. If you're lucky, it does. If it doesn't, you've got to go through the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had uh, civilian instructors there. They didn't have enough pilots or um, Army personnel to instruct us. They had uh, uh, civilians. And the 21-year or 22-year-old instructor I had had four students. And you had to solo that thing between eight and 12 hours. If you didn't, you were done. And uh, of the four, I, I kind of I kind of bragged I was the first one to solo. Uh, I, pulled, I sold it at eight hours. Thanks. And then, uh, then, of course, the pilot, or the instructor, concentrated on the other three guys and told me to go on up and fly the airplane. Well, he'd already shown me some uh, uh, 
acrobatics. And uh, I said, well, what will I do up there? And he said, do some acrobatics. <laughs> so the first one, the easiest one to do was a loop. And that thing didn't go fast enough so you could go right around like that. Uh, you had to dive it first and then go up. Well, I dove it and I got up on top. I forgot to tighten my belt. <laughs> you see, that's an open cockpit. And doggone it, I fell out of the cockpit <laughs> about six inches. And my feet fell off the rudders, and the dirt in the bottom of the plane fell in my eyes. And I was kind of scared. <laughs> I haven't had a laxative since, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, I knew. You had to have speed to make a loop. Well, the rest of that was about an hour long. I just flew straight and level. Incidentally, that plane, they told us, if you just let it low go of the control, you can't get out of it, just let go of them, and the airplane will come out of it. Well, I didn't do that, but I did come out of it with about 5,000 feet. I always went up to 5,000 before I did anything, because I wanted to move, just re recover. Anyway. I got back to the airport, and uh, of course after that I knew what I had to do. I had to go a little faster. So that, that was that was the, that was the primary. <laughs> Question: Were you always so gutsy, even as, at a younger age? Was that what? Were you always so gutsy because to be able to go up there after just eight hours and have you just trying to do a loop de loop or something? To me, it would be just so frightening that it would take somebody who's really got a lot of guts to well, do that. Well, what frightened me more, I'm afraid I'm going to end up in the infantry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason I went ahead and did it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so after two months there, two months there, we went on to a basic training. In basic training, you got a picture of that one? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yep. It's called the Baltic Vibrator. Uh, because it did really vibrate. And uh, for the first time we had uh, a little radio we could talk back and forth with the instructor. And with the PTs, 19 and 17, uh, we had a rubber hose stuck in my ear and he talked through a rubber hose. That's the way we got instruction. It's like a tin can. That was so good. But here we had a radio, we had a good radio. And we had more flight instruments so we could uh, feel more like we were learning how to fly. And we were under a hood, as you can see there. And no again, falling out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and not a little bit of canopy. And uh, the kind of nice thing I want to remember about that, uh, the, the uh, flight attendants on the field were all young girls. And that was kind of nice. I remember uh, getting into one of those things one time, and I, I looked at this young girl, she was just standing on my wing. She was wearing a halter and shorts, and all I could see was her belly button. <laughs> I, I don't know if my aunt and I want to hear any more of this story. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and that thing, um, one thing that stands out for me is that um, one of the things we had to do, the instructor would take, he had about four students. We'd fly to an auxiliary field, and we had to learn how to make emergency landings. And so the four of us would fly around in the circle about 2,000 feet and wait for a call from the instructor on the ground to cut our engine and, pull and try to land. And uh, you didn't know where he was going to cut you. Well, I did that. But they always told us to, to clear the engine so that when you landed and then took off again, we just it was running takeoff. You could give it to uh, throttle and you take off. Well, I did all that. And I gave it the throttle and went after he called me and that landed. And the darn airplane choked and sputtered and it just cleared the fence. So he chewed me out. He said, you're supposed to clear that engine on the way down. And I said, I did. He said, no, you didn't. So he said, go on up and fly in the circle again. I'll call you again. Well, he called me again. And I said to myself, I hope this thing done. I hope it's all up. Well, that's a heck of a thing. <laughs> Well, he came in and made the landing, gave it the throttle, and it did the same thing. I just cleared the fence. 
And he, he called back and said, well, you better take that back to the main field and write it up. Tell them that something needs, something wrong with it. Yeah. And the next day I saw the motor off the airplane. <laughs> there was something wrong. So I, I got out of that. Got out of that. <laughs> that was basic training. And from there we went to advanced training, the AT-6. You got an AT-6? I got an AT-6 right there. Now they say if you fly that, you can fly anything. And they say it's more difficult to fly that than a P-51. But you go from that to a P-51. And incidentally, I was in single engine because I, they said I was too small to fly a, a multi-engine airplane. I wanted, I wanted a transport because uh, transport, you didn't, you didn't have to shoot at anybody, you didn't have to drop bombs. I, I was, I was more of a lover than a fighter. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had to, I had to take this kind of training. Uh, and let's see, what what do I remember about that thing? It was a nice airplane, and, and you, and I, and again, I was the first one to solo the instructor. We had army personnel in the teachings, and golly, I had a a southerner, and he was still fighting the Civil War, and he didn't like me at all. <laughs> but uh, I was going to be nice to him because I didn't want to win the infantry. And so so uh, there was one time flying the flying, flying in the pattern to land, and uh, you're supposed to keep the constant altitude. Well, I'm doing pretty good, I thought. And he didn't think so. And he grabbed the stick. He sat back. And he pushed it back and forth. The canopy was open, and all my pencils and everything flew out the window. <laughs> well, anyway, I tried better to keep the thing straight and level and to constant altitude. That's quite fair. <laughs> what is that big black thing in the very front? Was that your antenna for your wing? It's the mast, yeah. That big yeah. black thing sticking It's a mast at the end. Aerial? You mean? Yeah. That was the aerial. We have a lot of radios on that. That's right? Yeah. yeah. Was, was, was that your, for your antenna? No, that's a. That's a, probably a wire goes back to the tail. Yeah. <coughs> that was part of the radio system. Yeah. And that we had to do some night flying too. So, and you know, that's something. Uh, my last, my last, last flight was a night flight. So, you had to do your own navigating. Yeah. And we navigated from point to point by beacons. And you could see a beacon and, and it had color, colors coded. And we had map, and we could tell where we were by the color of that light on the beacon. Well, that's a heck of a big thing, but that's what we did. <laughs> and I got almost, we, we were in Moulton, Georgia, <clears throat> and that particular night I got almost to the golf course, and I heard, got this radio message, come on back, there's a fog down there, but we want you to come back. Also, radio out that everybody should come back because the fog is coming in. Well, I, I went back. And on my place. <laughs> but uh, our squadron commander did it. He landed in Atlantic somewhere. Atlantic, Georgia. <laughs> we, uh, we never saw him. <laughs> <laughs> so it went from there? Yeah. Well, after that you go to transition. Well, it took 50 of us right out of there and made us co-pilots on B-24s. And uh, I'm not supposed to fly a multi-engine plane, I'm too small. But I did. <laughs> they uh, put me in with a, with a, made me co-pilot. I'd never been in a 24, but uh, I would replace a co-pilot that was ready to go overseas. The crew was ready to go, and they wanted it to go. So they put me in as co-pilot, and poor Chet had to train, train me uh, on the job training. And we flew, we flew across the ocean. Where'd you pick up the plane? Topeka, Kansas. Brand new airplane. And we flew up to somewhere in Massachusetts or somewhere in Northern. Yeah. But on the way, we traveled, we flew over my dad's farm. And we circled it. <laughs> it was in the afternoon. That was kind of fun. Yeah. And uh, I, I should have dropped the winter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we landed in uh, somewhere in New England, and uh, from there, we were went to Bermuda. We had to travel at night, single planes flying the ocean. 
Chet was 21, I was 22, just kids. We had 10 people in our airplane total, and we were to land in Bermuda. And on the way to Bermuda, this was at night, uh, we flew 10,000 feet, any higher than that, you have to have oxygen. And, uh, gee, we uh, got into a heck of a storm. And the navigator was supposed to use the stars to navigate by, but heck, we had a cloud cover, he couldn't navigate. So we flew the length of time that it would take to get to Bermuda. Time was up, but there was no Bermuda. And so, we had a radio compass. We could tune into a radio station in Bermuda, and a little arrow would point to where we should be, where we should go. And so that's what we did. We turned into the radio, and we had to fly through the storm. Chet and I both had to hang on to the thing that we were going on. I, I'm thinking about the poor guys in the back. <laughs> we didn't have seat belts and all that. Seats or anything else, I don't know what we did. <laughs> We, I was a kid too, so yeah, I didn't know. And, uh, we got into Bermuda and came, we had to drop out of the clouds. And by golly, there were the lights were. We made it. <laughs> Just made it. And then from there to the Azores, and that's a little spot in the ocean too. And, uh, we, we managed to find that. The American East Africa, then on to uh, um, Barry, Italy, where we got our assignment. What were your impressions of flying a B-24? Because you'd come from the, the single engines, you were actually training to be a fighter pilot, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're popped on this B-24, uh, four engine, heavy bomber. Um, what were your impressions of flying that thing? Uh, not positive. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one thing I did like about it. There were two pilots, so one of you got sick or something. You could still probably survive. So I, I like that. <laughs> now, did your size make, really make much of a difference because they said you were so small? Yes, it made a difference. I had six seats under me, two or three in front and back of me to put me up where I could reach the pedals. Really? Okay. Yes. And Chet, he was good. He just looked at me. What did I draw? What decided you, you said that you would have liked to have done a fire uh, yeah. You changed your mind. I didn't change it. The government did. Yeah. Well, the government, yeah. 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 They decided what, what you're going to do. Uh, they ask you what you want to do, and then they tell you what you're going to do. Yeah. That's what they needed. They needed pilots. Uh, co pilots. So yeah. Nobody wanted to be a co pilot. Yeah. So, question. So you went straight from single engine without going through the multi engine training? I did not go through the multi engine no. I went right from that thing to a 24 with four engines. 1,200 horsepower. For him to manage. <laughs> um, so I've got a map here uh, showing where you were in Italy and in, you know, in relation to, to Europe and everything. You went to an airfield called Pantanella. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was part of a larger airfield complex around Foggia. Um, there were something like 21 airstrips around there. McGovern the was up there at the Green Arrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you, you were there at the same time that McGovern, and it, people know who George McGovern is, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, he wrote um, a book, and then <laughs> In fact, I, I'm, I'm, I was a little surprised that uh, GP said yes. Uh, to doing this, because the first time I ever asked him about his flight experience, he walked over to his bookshelf, pulled this book off the shelf, and kind of tossed it over to me, and he said, this is about George McGovern, um, and I was at the next airfield over, and I was at the same time, and so all the stories they tell about here, I was on those missions, that's what it was like, just read that. <laughs> Let's see, where are we? Uh, let me, let me retract just a little bit. When you were on the train to go from Syracuse to Atlanta, and they asked you to get off, and then get back on and go where you went, did you notice that all African Americans and Nazis that were on that train were up ahead, or the 
the Nazis were allowed to sit with uh, Caucasians, where the African Americans were still shoved to the rear train. Was did that still happen during World War II? Let me before you answer that. I, I'll. Uh, I'll I've been bad about this. Let me uh, repeat the questions to people um, so everybody can hear what the questions are. So the question is about uh, when you're on these trains going from basic training to advanced training to, to this base to that base, the question is did you notice um, the segregation uh, of the trains? Were the, were the trains segregated uh, from whites and African Americans and then if if so, did you know, also notice that maybe like prisoners of war, like German prisoners of war, did they get better treatment on the trains than, say, African Americans? Did not see that or notice that on that particular thing, but when I got stationed in the South, I noticed it down there that the blacks had separate water, water bottles, separate toilet facilities. Yeah. And what year was they that? got awful treatment. 42, 43. Oh, that was 42, 43. Yeah. We weren't integrated at that time either, of course. And as a matter of fact, we didn't have any, any blacks. Any, 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 I didn't run into them at all while I was in training. No, but this is actually a good segue into one of your, your stories. So we've gotten you to Italy, and this is um, one of your stories where you, you had an encounter with the, the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, gosh, yes. That's what I was going to <laughs> Yeah. So do you want to you share that story about the, yeah, the mission? And uh, yeah. This, uh, this B-24, fully loaded, weighs 60,000 pounds. Um, and uh, I'll probably get a little mixed up here in the question. <laughs> but okay. I, wanted to, I wanted to point that out. And they cost $250,000 a new. And when we got over there with this new airplane, the old pilots took it away from us and gave us an old one. Old one. They were they wanted the old one. So you didn't get that shiny new one to fly your missions. And incidentally, that new plane we took over flew five missions and got shot down. So so we that didn't last very long. But uh, what was that question? So the question was um, the mission uh, where you were escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh yeah. Well. You know, uh, I never did see a, an enemy fighter while we were flying these missions, uh, but we did have a lot of flak, and, and that's just about as bad. And B-24s, uh, bombers, when you get to the target, uh, the whole thing is turned over to the bombardier. The pilot just sit there. And for three minutes, you just sail over that target, being shot at by flak. And, uh, it's kind of scary, it's kind of <laughs> stuff like that. But anyway, um, this one time um, we came off the target and then we got control up again. And we found that we had a bomb or two hung up in the in the racks. And you can't have that. You can't shut you gotta shut those doors. And um, so Chet uh, sent uh, the bombardier and the engineer back to try to loosen those bombs up. Well, they managed to, it was a cluster of bombs, I guess, and they managed to get them loose and they fell through. But down, when they got down about a thousand feet from us, one of them blew up, and the concussion kind of bothered us a little bit. One of our engines wouldn't work well. We had to bend there. Uh, so now we got three engines, and we couldn't keep up with the, with the formation going back, and they're not going to wait around for you. Well, you don't like a lone airplane out there. And by golly, these Tuskegee guys, they were five, flying 5,000 feet above us, <coughs> keeping an eye on us. Now, two or three of them came right down. I didn't see them yet. Yeah. One of the others was always flying with me. And uh, uh, one of them flew on Chet's side. He came up kind of gently, moved his showed his wings, because he didn't want to get shot either. <laughs> And uh, we saw that it was a friendly aircraft. He came in close and they stayed right with us until we got over out of enemy territory. And then he gave a big, took off his mask and a grin like that and checked on see his white teeth. And he felt pretty good. The Tusky, they were good. They were good. And we never saw them, but they were there. 
we wound up there. They escorted every mission. They, they, yeah, at, uh, at an altitude. We didn't see them. That's all. But, uh, it was kind of no, it's nice to know they were there. Yeah. So if any enemy aircraft got in the area, they took care of them. Why did they fly 5,000 feet above you? The, the question was, why did the why did the fighter escorts fly 5,000 feet above? Well, they had a better chance at that altitude to see any any aircraft. Okay. And if they did see it, they they were on it, right on it. Think about that. That's yes, question. Well, I, uh, I read in one place uh, that uh, sometimes if the uh, white escorts were uh, assigned to uh, bomber groups, some of the bomber groups said we don't want them want to just in the area. Yeah, so the, the, the statement was uh, that he'd seen somewhere that. Um, the bomber crews actually preferred to be escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen because they were so good than the uh, the, the uh, white uh, fighter escorts. I, I don't know about the difference in I imagine they were both pretty darn good, but they were good. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to be because they had to prove themselves. And, uh, so they, and they did. <laughs> um, so I, I just kind of want to share some of the, the stories you had from from some of your missions, um, and this one isn't mission specific, but it's kind of <laughs> kind of fun when you had a little uh, little issue that would come up at about twelve thousand feet every time, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't think at the time that I was scared, but now looking back, hindsight, I think I was a little. You see, um, before a mission, before, you knew the night before you were going to fly the next day. But at 4.30, they'd wake you up, and uh, you'd uh, get into a truck, get dressed, get into a truck, go eat. Usually reconstituted eggs, spam, all that good stuff. But I, I never bothered. That did not worry me very much, because that was really better stuff than what I was eating at Cornell, because uh, I was cooking for myself. 